Um, we have a text today from the book of Job. Something one of his friends said to him in his sufferings. Job chapter 22, verse 21, where he simply said, Agree with God and be at peace. Let us pray together. Let the power of your word and your spirit and the sharpening fellowships that we have with one another, let it bring the tranquility of divine order, salvation in each of our lives and the merits of Christ. And touch us, Lord, where our memories hurt and bring healing. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the poet Patterson Smith wrote this. And the ghosts of forgotten actions came floating before my sight. And the things that I thought were dead things were alive with a terrible might. And the vision of all my past life was an awful thing to face. Alone, alone with my conscience in that strange and terrible place. Libby was a senior at Elon College when I met her. Uh, she came forward after one of our chapels and said that she had gotten drunk in the autumn and she'd gotten pregnant. And now here it was winter. She had been to an abortion clinic, uh, $1,200, snip, snip, took care of it. She's happy. Everything's back to normal, right? Except she couldn't sleep. And she had a reoccurring nightmare of a baby chasing her. Crying. Shakespeare's Richard III has a wonderful kingly soliloquy in it where the king struts the stage fretfully and he says this My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tongue condemns me for the villain that I am. Uh, Jack is one of those villains. He's a World War II vet. He told me 30 years ago that he had rounded a village in Germany toward the end of the war and run right into the chest of a German Nazi soldier, a young private just like him. And he said, what I remember is the surprised look on his face. Mine probably was as big a surprise as his. But I also remember those blue, blue eyes and that Nordic blonde, blonde, Aryan hair. And he said, we scuffled and I got my bayonet before he got his and I stabbed him in the chest. And he said, I can still see the surprise look on his face a second time. And then the terror in his eyes. And I, we, we stood there choking each other until the strength drained out of his life. And he fell to the ground. And he said, there's not a day that goes by that I don't know that I'm a killer, that I don't relive that man's face, the surprise look <laughs> on his face, and watching him die. There's a popular song from our youth that you might remember by Barbara Streisand. Memories light the corners of my mind, misty water-colored memories of the way we were. Uh, one of my friends, Ken, tells me that he had premarital sex with a lot of different women in his wild youth. And he said, though I'm married now for over 20 years, I've never cheated on my wife. But every time I'm intimate with her, every time I'm holding her in my embrace, I see a parade of other women come by. And my mind begins to compare and contrast. Remember that hot little number in Georgia? She looked like this. My wife looks like that. Or don't forget that girl in Charleston. She did it this way. My wife does it this way. And he said, I have learned the hard way what the Bible calls adultery, an uncleanliness, a memory in your past that's with someone that's not yours to embrace. And he said, the comparing and contrasting is so bad that it often renders me impotent. The doctors have a name for that, actually. It's called uh, ISD. You ever heard that? Inhibited sexual desire. 
And often it comes from stringing ourselves out between so many partners, nothing arouses us anymore. It's the great trouble with pornography too. Uh, Joan had a newborn baby uh, back in the 80s. She dressed the little boy, cleaned him for the coming over of her good friend. Uh, they took the little baby out dressed and went to tea and lunch and came back and put the sleeping child in the crib. And then she went over to the closet and took out in a dry cleaning bag a wonderful dress she had bought that she was just about to fit into again, getting her figure back from pregnancy. And when she finished displaying the new dress to her friend, she hung the dress in the closet. Well, her friend actually said, shouldn't you get that plastic and put it back on it, but certainly get it away from the crib. Oh, no, the child's sleeping. Everything will be all right. So they went in the next room, visited for an hour. The friend went home. And when John went in to check on her baby again, the breeze through the open window had blown that plastic over that little sleeping toddler. And the child was dead in his crib from smothering. Every now and then, Joan says, still on a beautiful spring day with a slight breeze, all the pain of her incompetence comes back that she, because of her laziness, killed her only child. Now, the problems we've been talking about are problems of the memories, things that we've done things that we've not done, things that have been done to us that we didn't deserve. They kill us softly. I'm talking about rape, a frightening childhood experience with an animal, angry words, a rejection. These things can be devastating. Now, you each know what I'm talking about. Each night when you lay your head on your pillow, there's this primordial ghost, a ghoul, that rises from the ashes from the rot of his grave. And he said to us just before we fall asleep, Boo, remember me? And the ghost of forgotten actions come floating before my sight. The things that I thought were dead things are alive with a terrible might. Now, I want us to look today at the theology of the healing of the memories. Not just the healing of our physical bodies, but a type of healing emotionally, mentally, the healing of the memories. But first of all, I want us to look at some poor ways that we handle the healing of our memories. One way is to stage and restage the painful memory. Oh, remember that? Yes, I do. Well, you remember that look on their face when they said that ugly thing to you? I, I do. And remember how cold it made you feel inside? You just shattered, didn't you? And, and don't forget that they did this afterwards. And you said this, and it was tit for tat, escalating, until both of you were snarling like wild animals. And what you do when you stage and restage the event and remember it all over again, you meditate on it. You rehandle it. You go over the details. And you etch that pain deeper into your psyche. If you scrape your knee and it bleeds and it forms a scab, if you quit picking at it, quit scratching it, it would heal, wouldn't it? But you keep scratching the scab off and eventually it gets infected. And the infection is far worse than the original wound. We need to quit picking at our painful past. Another way that we mishandle our painful memories is just to rather blithely say, just give it time. Time what? It heals all wounds. Now, if you really believe that, that means you sat in a doctor's office waiting room for three hours and you got better so that when they finally called your name, you could say, I don't know, time heals all wounds. I'm better. I don't need to see you. I'll take my leave now. One of the most popular ways we mishandle our painful emotional past is through repression. Have you ever tried to take a beach ball in the pool and push it underwater? It's easy to do, isn't it? But it's a slippery thing. It slips out of your hand and you pushed it down here. It pops up there. And when we repress the sin in our lives, 
It has a way of slipping out of our grip. And sometimes even 10, 15 years later, boo, remember me? And the ghost of forgotten ash actions are there again. A psychiatrist actually told me that a really sick person with painful memories and emotional needs in their life can spend as much as 60 to 70% of today's energy dealing with the past. Wow. Will Rogers used to say we shouldn't let yesterday eat up too much of today. And yet a person who mishandles their evil past can spend 70% of their energy repressing the past. Another inferior way to handle your sins is to rationalize and run away. Everybody's got a skeleton or two or three or 10 in their closet. I'm no different. And we just stay busy, stay in a crowd, stay in a noisy place, stay liquored up, or stay high on whatever our pharmaceutical is your of the day is. Yet another way we handle it is through guilt. Now, the story usually goes like this with guilt. I was tempted. I gave in. I can't believe I did that. But I did it. That proves I'm a bad person. I hate myself. And that vicious cycle plays over and over again. It may help you to know something theologically. Sin in our lives is handled in only one of two ways. It's either forgiven or it's punished. Now I can point you to Russian literature, Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers uh, Karamazov. No, Crime and Punishment. It's about a, a young man named Raskolnikov, who's a brilliant student, but he's flat broke. He can't eat. He's having trouble buying his books, but he knows he can really contribute to life if he can just get his education. And one of the ladies that he does some odd jobs for is an old, old woman, very wealthy, who's lived her life and, by his reasoning, is close to death. And he says, why don't I just kill her and take her riches? I can finish my education and have a life that makes a difference. And so he rationalizes it ethically, the most good for the most people. He kills her. But then he's overwhelmed with guilt. And it's an expose of the psychological pain of being a murderer. He returns to the crime scene. He actually becomes friends with the detective. He goes back and visits the women's home. He's seen at her grave often. And eventually, in the desire to be not punished anymore by guilt, but to be forgiven, he confesses the crime to the detective. Beautiful study of crime and punishment. Now, let's talk about Christ and our painful memories, because so far we've talked about how not to handle our painful past. The text simply says, agree with God and be at peace. Let's look at what it means to be agreeable in the will of God as for our sins, what's been done to us or what we've done to others. Now, Jesus knows you. Did you know that? He knows everything you've ever done. He knows everything that's been said about you and been done to you. Even your deepest, darkest secrets, that rape, um, those ugly words you shared, he knows these things. And Almighty God is still willing and able to meet you where you are and still bring a blessing out of your life. He's more eager to forgive you than he is to punish you. In fact, he says, look at the cross. I'd rather hurt myself than let you hurt anymore. The Bible says in Psalm 143, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Now, how does the Lord do that? By the cross, that was the atonement of our sins, and by our repentance and faith, in Jesus, where we receive that atonement for ourselves. I grew up in the 50s, just up the road in Graham, Burlington, North Carolina, and we had a neighborhood bully. And yes, his name really was Butch. Huh. 
He was a couple years older than me and about 25 pounds heavier. And he loved to jump out and surprise me. And if he could, he would tackle me and sit on my chest. And he would pick up dirt and drop it in my mouth. And he would say, say, uncle, and I'll let you out. Well, you just would do anything you could, writhing in pain, trying to bite him to get him off of you because you didn't want to say uncle. It was humiliating. And he would take that grass and just shove it right in your mouth. And uh, as you mumbled and cried out, you were eating grass. He was a bully. Satan is that type of bully. When we sin, Satan likes to bully us until we cry, Jesus, that is. The text says, agree with God and be at peace. When Satan brings up our past, he likes to light his pipe, damp it down a little bit, take a puff, and says, you're hurting, aren't you? Tell me about it. And his purpose is to get you to meditate on the sinful past, to to etch it deeper and deeper into your life. I did it. It was wrong. I take full responsibility. Have mercy on me, Lord, in the merits of Christ. Now, when we go to Christ like that, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, becomes what we call the Christian bar of soap. If we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, often this type of forgiveness or spiritual healing is not enough. We need emotional healing that goes along with it. Now, Jesus healed the blind, the lame, the hot, the dying. He physically healed people all the time. But does Jesus heal mental illness? Can he heal our emotional past? If you look in the fifth chapter of Mark, you meet Legion, who was an emotional basket case. The Bible says he's nude, he's crazy, he screams, he lives alone in a cemetery, he's been chained there. And when he can, he gets rocks and bruises or bashes himself with stones. Would you say he qualifies for a mentally ill person? Jesus healed him, he saved him and healed him. And the text says literally, and he was in his right mind. So there's evidence that there's emotional healing, that he can put us back in our right mind. And that's hard for us to do because we humans live in three dimensions. We live in the dimension of the future, which we only have access to by our anticipation. But as soon as the future has come to me, that word me I just said is in the past. So the future is streaming to us through our comprehension and anticipation. And then there's this infinitesimal moment called the present. But the present is streaming out the back door of our life into the past. And we have access to the past by our memory. And this is where Satan knows that he can get us and put a rock in our shoe that we limp with the rest of our life with devastating emotional pain. Jesus, though, teaches us he's the Alpha and the Omega. That's the beginning and the end. He's using the alphabet, saying, I'm the A to Z. I'm the beginning and the end. Christ is not trapped into the future or the past or the present like we are. Do you remember when Jesus defended himself as the Son of God? He said of himself, I am that I am. Not, I will be, or I used to be, and not, I am for this brief moment. But he said, I am the eternal now. I am outside of time and space, outside of the material world, and I am born in it incarnationally. But I am the Lord of the past, the present, and the future. And so his not being limited to the present means that Jesus can walk into our past and he can stand there with us in our moment of great trial or great woundedness or when we did something dastardly ourselves. And we can look him in the eye 
and we can say, I'm so glad you're here. Forgive me of this. And would you touch me? Would you heal my memories? Would you take away the detrimental emotional impact of all of this? And that Jesus Christ can do. Now, Scripture teaches us to confess our sins one to another. Often this is a journey that we don't take alone. There are people who are charismatically or Holy Spirit gifted to take your confession, whether it's a priest or a pastor or a good friend in the Bible study. And often they can walk with you back into that painful past and help you into Jesus' presence and help you experience the mercy of the Lord in your past. Now let's talk about staying healed. You can catch the flu, can't you? And if you don't take care of yourself, you can have a relapse. And if you don't take care of yourself in the relapse, my wife says you can have a collapse. So you can have the flu, the relapse, and the collapse. And it's the same with the healing of the memories, the same with forgiveness. We can be forgiven, we can be healed, but we have a relapse back into our old ways. Now here we need to understand that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren in at least three places in the Bible. And he says that he accuses them when? Day and night. The word Satan actually means adversary, one who is set against you. Christ is absolutely committed to reestablishing God's image in you that was broken in sin in the fall to make you Christ-like. But Satan is equally committed to destroy that image of God in you. And if you're forgiven, he wants to take away your knowledge of the healing of the memories so that you walk in the pain of that past that he accuses you of day and night. He loves to say, you did that, didn't you? How bloody awful. I don't know any Christians who do such a thing. You must not be a Christian. You're just beyond the pale of salvation. You're worthless. I'm so ashamed of you. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Now, the key is to arrest your thoughts and take them to Christ and his word. Let me show you how that works. If I have a glass of water up here that's pure, and somebody puts some dirt in it, the water turns dirty. How can I get the dirt out of that glass? I could just take the glass and pour it out and fill it up again. That's one way. Or I could extrude the dirt out of it. I could take a, a, a higher density liquid like, say, mercury, and pour it down the side of the glass. And since mercury is heavier than water, it flows to the bottom of the cup, and it fills up, and it extrudes the dirty water over the sides and out until you have it filled. The Word of God is like that in our lives. Uh, the Word of God comes and fills us as we memorize it, as the Spirit applies it, and it can replace the pain of the past with thinking about that in terms of Christ and the cross. Now, here's the key. Every time Satan accuses you of your past, remind him of his future. He doesn't have one. Every time he accuses you of the past, run to the cross and remind Satan of what Jesus has done for the forgiveness of your sins in the cross. Agree with God and be at peace, the text says. I agree that happened. I take responsibility for my part in that. Christ, forgive me. And now let me learn to think about that past event through the lens of Scripture. How can a young man keep his way pure, the psalmist wrote? By guarding it according to thy word. I have laid up thy word in my heart, O Lord, that I might not sin against thee. So when Satan comes along and he says, you did that, didn't you? Tell me about it. Just simply say, no, I'm not going into the details. That's forgiven sin. 
And that sin helped nail Christ to the cross, and I did it. I'm responsible for that. But he rose again, and he comes to me as a peacemaker and offers me his blood as an atonement for my sins. And I'm going to think about that, Satan, not what I did, but what Christ did for me. And if every time Satan tentilates your memories with your painful, sinful past, if you run to the cross, Satan hates the cross. And if he stimulates you, and the only good he gets of it is you run for the cross and kneel there, then he's going to back off and find some other way to try to come at your life. So when Satan reminds you of your past, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to wallow in it, meditate on it, re-etch it, or you're going to run to the cross, and Satan's going to, as the Bible says, resist the devil, and he will what? He will flee from you. Now, there's a lot of questions over whether you can really forget. I have a, a scar on my wrist right here. And I see it every day. And I vaguely remember as a five-year-old boy playing in the front yard with a knife, flipping the knife up in the air, and it came down and landed, stuck up in my wrist. And I remember playing foolishly with a knife that I shouldn't have had. I've forgiven myself for that. I've forgiven my brother for putting me up to it. Um, I still have the scar. And I still have the cognitive awareness of how it got there and what I did and my responsibility. But you know what? It doesn't hurt anymore. So at least the Holy Spirit can take away the detrimental emotional impact of the painful scars you bear in your memory. I do believe that you can actually forget. You know, people are always telling us pastors in confession something that they've done. And then sometimes 10, 11, 12 years later, they're depressed and you didn't look at them right when you shook hands at the door and they think that you're judging them and don't love them anymore. And they'll come in and want to talk to you and they say, you're holding my past against me, aren't you? And I'd say, what, what are you talking about? Well, at the door of the church, you weren't friendly. I could see in your eyes, you looked down on me. You you didn't, you didn't believe in me. And I'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. Do you remember 12 years ago when I told you I did thus and so? I only vaguely remember that. And you can actually forget people who sinned against you and hurt you. I see people all the time that with my mind, I can remember the dastardly things they did to hurt my ministry. But I see today a person who's outgrown that who's not to be judged on the contents of their worst day. And it doesn't hurt anymore. And I think God wants to bring us to those places of the healing of the memory. In 73, I married my wife, Catherine, and we took off with a little book tucked under our arms called Europe on five and $10 a day, except we were making Europe on three or $4 a day. I can still remember riding a train all night into Copenhagen and we were both exhausted. We got there and I said, uh, there's a, a hotel a block and a half from here. I'm going to go get us checked in and you can take a nap and I'll go out and find a place for breakfast and come back and get you. So she went in and was asleep. I come back to the hotel about 11 o'clock to take her to lunch. And there are all these women with lipstick and tight dresses standing around the outside of the hotel. They're harlots. And this is their brothel. And they look at me and offer me a piece of action, if you know what I mean. And I say, oh, no, no, thank you. Well, I go get my wife who comes walking out. You talk about women giving my wife the stink eye. We traveled across Europe on bread and peanut butter and water and occasional apple cider. Had a blast. But I remember when we were taken off, she had not traveled much. And I said, now I'm going to have to carry my suitcase and your suitcase, 25 pounds. Oh, I can get more than 25 pounds in my suitcase. And I said, sure, but I can't carry it. So you can have suitcase, 25 pounds. That was before they put wheels on them. I don't know why it took so long for that. 
anyway, we were traveling across Europe, been there a couple of months, and we're in Spain. Franco, still alive, we're in Spain. Catherine's suitcase due to souvenirs from Scotland and Wales and England, Scandinavia and Germany. She's got a 55 pound valise. Mine's still 25 pounds. I can remember walking about two miles in Madrid to a pension we rented and my arms just literally coming out of the sockets with her suitcase. I threw it up on the bed and I said, how many pounds? 25. What do I do with the rest of the stuff? Ship it home or give it away or take it and put it in the dumpster. And she was wailing and whatever, but we managed to send a big package home and 25 pounds. Often we go through life with excess baggage, don't we? And it literally pulls us apart at the joints. And scripture teaches it doesn't have to be like that. When God forgives, it says in the Psalms, as far away as the east is from the west, does he remove our transgressions from us. Now, he didn't say as far away as the north is from the south, or else you could have found your sins, because you can find the North Pole and South Pole, can't you? But where is the East Pole? Where is the West Pole? It also says in the Old Testament, God says, I will remember their sins no more. So that you confess the sin to the Lord. Satan accuses you of that sin two weeks later, and, and you go to the Lord and say, I'm so upset, Lord, I need to ask your forgiveness for this sin. And he said, what sin? You confessed that two weeks ago. I don't remember it anymore. What are you doing remembering it? You don't strive with God. You remember, agree with God, and be at peace. Agree that the cross paid the penalty for all human sins. And when you repent, that merit is put in your account. All sins can be forgiven. And you can go on and on. It says, uh, though your sins be like scarlet crimson, they what? They can be washed as white as snow. And I always remember uh, the enigmatic book of Revelation. He takes our sins and casts them in the depths of the sea. And then the book of Revelation says, and the sea shall be no more. Do you see how complete the forgetfulness of God is for our sins and his mercy when it's applied? And we can agree with that great mind that beats back of the universe. There's, there's nothing like the cross of Jesus Christ to heal our painful past. Would you pray with me? We thank you, Lord, that as we look at our wounds and often lick them and relive them, and often ride in pain and condemn ourselves for what we allowed to be done to us or what what we did or didn't do, that there is a remedy, that the peace of Christ that passes all understanding can rule again in our hearts and not the guilt and not the ugly crimes that we've committed. Help us each to learn to agree with you, Lord, and be at peace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's share a little bit. Anybody want to uh, add to what we've said or, or um, share an experience in your own life? Well, let me overcome my bashfulness long enough to, uh, to do this. Um, I'm going to change this back to a different view. Um, so, um, yeah, I wanted to say, uh, yes, the, for me, the important thing was knowing that, that when I confess my sin, God just removes it completely. He for, he's faithful to forgive me. And there were sins that I dealt with for a long time in my life. I just, you, you just get embarrassed. You have to keep going back and apologizing for the same thing over and over again. And it reminded me of, uh, when Rick was talking about the soil conversations, that um you know you have to you really you have to not just cut the weed back you have to pull the weed out and um i had to help a friend who had um 
who had some issues with some lust issues with his and his wife caught him um and um we prayed for him to be free from that and but the devil doesn't stop that's that's from the past but the devil knows the door he's been coming in and he will bring an image to you and and try to tempt you to embrace that image again especially with lust and um so i know in in my case i had to get to the point where i just said no i'm ripping that out of here i'm not falling for that anymore and when when an image an intrusive thought from my enemy would come um i would uh i would i would i'm taking this this thought captive to christ i, I don't want to think about that jesus i'm giving it to you so you have you have you it's not that and his wife sometimes well, did you think about this woman he said well her image came to me but i didn't think about it I didn't accept it she still felt like he was guilty because he was being tempted and we're not sinful for being tempted that is what the devil does we are sinful when we embrace it and um and and take it in and and and, and respond to it so that's the thing to be uh, there are people who struggle because they're still being tempted and um that is not sin being tempted is not sin it is embracing it that creates the sin in us so i just want people to be free from that kind of thinking Stephen. yes um I hope you remember our Monday morning was on forgiveness. And um, I thought what we covered in the forgiveness was very special and that it's not an option. It's God tells you that you need to forgive. And we're supposed to forgive others. And But one of the biggest things we have to do is forgive ourselves. And uh, I love how you covered that today, Stephen, uh, in how, how you do that. And, um, you know, James being on here, I love that he's here. Uh, we talked about this aspect of forgiveness. Uh, you, know, you know, the first commandment is you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second is like it, that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, if you don't love yourself and you can't love yourself if you've not forgiven yourself, then you can't even do the second commandment. So uh, I love how you covered that today, Stephen, and just wanted to thank you and uh, it just... It was perfect for following up for what we were trying to cover. Thank you, Bill. And uh, we're praying for rain down there in the Caribbean. <laughs> I'm thankful and I'm blessed. You know, uh, I don't know if Steve Ellis is there today, but uh, I remember visiting him here today. Um, so anyway, hope you guys are all doing well. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, Coach. I've heard it said that I've heard it said that uh, God throws our sins in the deepest part of the ocean, and then on a buoy he puts a no fishing sign, and that no fishing sign is primarily for us, not yeah. for others. Yeah, I have often reminded my congregation around Memorial Weekend that. Um, God casts our sins in the depths of the sea. And uh, I even preached one time on Legion, how he cast the demons out of them and they ran straight for the beach. And why is it that people want to miss church so much to go to the shore? Don't fight with the guy that has the microphone, people. Anyone else on forgiveness? Stephen, I just want to thank you. I know that was the reason I came today. and uh, That was a great message, which I'm going to share with some other people that I know. <clears throat> you touched on a couple of things. Coach Lamb hit one that I've always thought, you know, they say the two greatest commandments, and there's actually three there. Like he said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you don't love yourself, you know, that's, that's going to keep you from doing yeah. the other two. And that's one thing I remember 
back in my in the day, my the guy told me, he said, until you can figure out how to love yourself, you know, you won't stand much of a chance in recovery. Yeah. Um, another thing too that just hit me while we were talking, you know, you're talking about the devil tempting you. The devil is the one person who will sit there and say, Come on and do this. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And once you step over that line, he moves to the other side and said, Why did you do that for? And he throws the guilt on top of it. And uh, another thing you were talking about too, Stephen, real quick, which reminded me is that, um, you know, it's how we've heard it said that when God opens one door, when he shuts one door, he'll open another one, and the devil's willing to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, but that was a great message today. I really appreciate it. And um, it was just an awesome message. And I just wanted to share those couple of thoughts that I had. But uh, thank you all so much. One of the, uh, the tricks or, or blessed disciplines is to memorize scripture. If you're having trouble with, say, anger, Go through and memorize everything the Bible says about anger. And often when you get angry, the Holy Spirit will flash those Bible memory verses in your mind. Um, if you uh, get off an airplane and you go pick your suitcase up, they got this conveyor belt that's constantly turning and, you know, you, you hey, that's mine and you pluck it off. I have a conveyor belt in my mind. It's got Bible verse after Bible verse memorized. And often when Satan comes to me, the Holy Spirit will speed that conveyor belt up and it will stop. And this light blinks and this clarion of bells goes off. And you say that verse to yourself and you think, well, that's really trenchant to what I'm dealing with right now. And you're able to use the strength of that verse let into your life to extrude the dirty water out. The word of God is heavier than anything in your life. And just flee to that. But to memorize Bible verses that deal specifically with the sin that you're struggling with. Lust, divorce, bestiality, you can you can go down a long list. Anyone else? I just wanted to say when you said that, it reminded me of the jukebox and the Holy Spirit punching like A12 for bringing that up. J316. <laughs> right. Let's move beyond the lesson a little bit. And uh, maybe you have some announcements you'd like to make, something you'd like to share. My wife had surgery this morning. She was first in line. She had to be at the hospital at five. Wow. And uh, we got a call just before I came over here that she was out. And uh, there was no tumor. There was no primary source of the cancer. It was all in little specks here and there that scattered. And they said um, the, the medicine should take care of the rest of the cancer. So we're expecting a good, good outcome. My son, Brian, drove me over today in my doddering old age, and we're going to go see the little lady in a little bit. He's the one that looks like me, uh, but not quite as handsome as his old man. <laughs> Anyone else? Anything the Lord's been doing for you you want to share? He had no form of comeliness that we should desire him. <laughs> you don't have to give him a ride, Brian. Joe? Paul speaks to the subject of if how complimentary it is to be sinful and then be forgiven of your sins. He says, so what does that mean? Does that mean you really ought to sin more so you can be forgiven more? But Paul addresses that, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. No, you don't do it. You don't do that. But yeah. you, you know, you get, you're get blessed. You get forgiven. But don't, yeah. don't go out there and sin more because just because you want to be forgiven more. But mm -hmm. I'm going to work my way out of here. I've got to go to a doctor's appointment here. But just between y'all's little tip for tat there, uh, J.D. Greer said one time he was talking to his wife on the way home from a sermon that he thought was particularly good and he said honey how many really great preachers do you think are alive today and she said 
Probably one less than you're thinking. <laughs> here, here. Here, here. Anyone else? Something the Lord's doing for you these spring days. James, I know you got something that's just brewing up there, brother. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I have to admit, I just want to say thank you for inviting me today. It's amazing how God knows exactly what you need and when you need it. And uh, I mean, uh, Coach Lamps, um, you know, uh, talking about forgiveness uh, this on Monday. And, uh, you know, I kind of shared the testimonial there and everything about Coach Lamb and helping me with an issue. But uh, uh, just today, this has even been even more beneficial uh, for me because uh, we were just talking about on yesterday. I was telling you, Steve, how I uh, have Coach Lamb on Monday morning. We have a, a, a men's Bible study on Tuesday morning that we needed to go to. And then I had another one on Wednesday that this guy who left that Bible study went in the western part of the state. So we do a Zoom on Wednesday mornings and we got our Friday mornings. And this is what was missing on Thursdays. I, I needed something for Thursdays. <laughs> and God allowed you to put this here this day for this for, for me, actually, because uh and the Bible study yesterday, we were talking, frankly, I mean, gosh, I, the Holy Spirit, I don't hope this isn't offensive to anybody there, but the Holy Spirit was convicting me because oh uh, no, the Holy Spirit. Uh, allowed me to share with the guys yesterday when the guy was talking about abortion. The guy on Friday was talking about abortion, and uh, and he was talking about uh, women and 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 how it affected as a woman. And frankly, uh, I share it with the guys that the bottom line is, I mean, uh, if a man actually participates in that, that it can have that same type of effect on them, because uh, frankly, it was a. Uh, situation when I was in college that I, I well, to sum all this up, it, it had haunted me for years that I didn't stop a girl from having an abortion. And, uh, and, and one of the things that came out of Bible study yesterday was it challenges me and haunts me like it did because I hadn't forgiven myself. And being here today, God allowed you to minister to me. See, and I just want to tell you, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Because, um, and, and yes, uh, I know God has forgiven me in everything. Uh, God has forgiven her or whatever. But, but when I look back at that, and I raised three boys, and the fact that I didn't have a girl, and uh, in the back of my mind, I felt like I was being punished because that was probably my daughter that um, that the, the the girl may have aborted. And uh, but hearing this today and the, what we had yesterday and Coach Lamb on Monday, I mean, God's feeding me about that forgiveness of letting go, if you will, and allowing that Holy Spirit, if you will. To, yes, uh, as you were talking about with the knife. I mean, the, the, the scar is there, but the pain doesn't have to be there, if you will. You know, if a person will just uh, realize that that the, uh, the mistake that was made then, God, uh, Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for that sin, just like all the others I committed. And the way that I've been able to uh, accept and forgive myself and know that Jesus has forgiven me for those other things, I mean... I don't have to carry that burden either, if you will. So, but uh, but but I, the, the the message yesterday I was conveying to the guys yesterday though is that uh, if a person can participate in that and and not look back and not you know feel some remorse or or realize that 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 uh, that and, and even though I have to let go of it, it's it's less than human for me to to not look at that life that was lost even before it was born. And realize that even as a man, I didn't have the, I didn't, um, I couldn't make that final decision. But the fact that I didn't speak out, and we need to take a stand for that. And when it comes to abortion, I mean, it's, it's yes, people talk about choice. Uh, as men, uh, if we have a role, uh, anything that we can do to prevent it, we need to. I need to do that if you will, speak out against that. But I just want to thank you today for helping me and ministering to me about forgiving. 
you know, forgiveness and forgiving myself. One of the ways to uh, remember what we talked about today is the tautology that says, don't ever let what's happened to you be greater than what Christ has done for you. Amen. Don't ever let what you've done be greater than what Christ has done for you. The atonement of Christ is more powerful than any sin. Steve always is good about getting these teachings up on the web, and you can also get this in printed form, written form. Just go to carolinastudycenter.com, click on the icon sermons, and they're not in alphabetical order, but if you go through them, down towards the bottom of the page, you'll see the healing of the memories. Amen. The written, written version of what we studied. And and uh, but on a more positive note, what I like to say is I, I appreciate this forgiveness and everything you're ministering about forgiveness because that is something that God has helped me with over the years because I've been born and raised on, with, on a farm outside of Rocky Mountain and everything and and we always had uh, I guess uh, uh, um, uh, plenty of food from that farm to give away and I was a very giving person but uh, I. Uh, I was a, of the premise going up, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you. We're going to let you get over there twice and everything. And what God dealt with me on that uh, was that when it comes to forgiveness, even if a person takes advantage and everything, uh, if if I hold on to that and don't forgive, I, we have to forgive not just because uh, we need to do it because as God has forgiven us, like he said, but a person not forgiving, that's like if you do something to me and I don't forgive you. That's like me drinking poison and hoping you die. <laughs> I mean, it, it can't do anything to you, but it can eat me up inside and everything. So I got to make sure that I do forgive and even ask for forgiveness so that I can let that burden go and it won't have that adverse effect on me, if you will. So you have to be willing to forgive. Well, our time is uh, up today. Let's bow and pray. And now go out into the world in peace, have courage, and hold on to that which is good. Return no man evil for evil, but help the faint-hearted, warn the unfaithful, honor everyone, love and serve the Lord rejoicing, rejoicing always in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship, the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you each. Amen. 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 Good to see you, James. Thank you all so much. God bless you. I look forward to meeting you next week. Yeah, man. It's great. Right, have a good week.